Welcome to the Act and Unwind podcast, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. Thank you for listening. And I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. This week, I'm joined by Sam Gregg, Acton's Director of Research, and Dad Huger, Librarian and Research Associate here at Acton. Today, we'll discuss foreign policy through a post-liberal lens and the ongoing Joe Rogan controversy. But first, I want to go to Canada, where there has been an ongoing protest blockade, uh, something we're not used to seeing in polite Canada that has been snarling the capital city of Ottawa as well as supply chain lines. So what is happening is the vaccine mandate that has been implemented by the Canadian government, there was an exemption for truckers as essential service providers, that they would be, if they were not vaccinated, exempted from the testing and quarantining requirements if they were to exit and re-enter the country. Uh, that was to expire, prompting this kind of protest that has been happening where these truckers, and what's interesting about this whole incident is uh, these protesters come with their own blockade devices, the trucks that they drive. Uh, so they've encircled uh, the Capitol in Ottawa, and they were also blocking until this morning the Ambassador Bridge, which exists between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario, and is a major supply chain line for moving goods across the border one way and the other. That bridge, as of this morning, has been cleared and arrests have been made. Uh, so, Sam, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you first. Um, I'm tempted to just ask a very simple question about this. What do you make of the merits of this Canadian trucker protest and blockade? Well, thanks, Eric. One thing I think it's important to note is that the people who are involved in this, who are uh, blockading Ottawa, who... Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has more or less described as enemies of the state. 90% of them are vaccinated. 90% <laughs> of them are vaccinated. So, uh, and, the, and of course, these are people for whom the country relies upon for the supply of goods and services that you don't notice until they suddenly go away. So uh, it, it seems to me that what this generally reflects is a couple of things. One is fatigue, fatigue with all the restrictions, fatigue with, with uh, the government of Canada and lots of other governments around the world uh, pursuing a particular approach to the pandemic that seems to have uh, gone by its used up date. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think which is noticeable about this, it's, it's a class thing as well. Because uh, these are people who can't work from home. These are people who can't uh, sit on the couch and use their laptop to do their work. These are people who have to drive trucks for a living. And we forget, I think, sometimes there's a whole category of people and forms of employment out there who can't transition so easily towards at-home work or work online or any number of forms by which they're able to reorientate themselves so that they don't have to go into an office or the usual things that used to happen in a pre-COVID world. Uh, and, and these are the people who I think in many respects have borne much of the burden of uh, the, the lockdowns, the various responses of governments to the pandemic. And plainly, they've had enough. So this is not an anti-vax movement. These are not people who have a problem with being vaccinated or have some sort of deep ethical objection to, to these sorts of uh, things. These are people who are fed up with the way that governments are treating them. And I think that's the sort of broader message that's going on. It's ironic, actually, also that, as I'm sure both of you have seen, that in many respects this is, this is being called a working class uprising, 
that the left is opposed to in a way that it, that is quite incredible. So there's a lot of very curious political dynamics that have emerged here, but I do think it's reflective of the stage we are at in terms of how people are reacting and thinking about the pandemic and how far in some respect some respects certain governments like the government in Canada, like the government in New Zealand are behind where people are in the in their countries when it comes to thinking about how we deal with what I think is now a post-pandemic stage. Sam stole my observation there, which is the in observing this whole thing as it has progressed, the the words that keep ringing in my mind are the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Uh, workers of the world unite. You have, as Sam said, this movement of workers uh, getting together and rising up. And the fascinating dynamic about it is how much the political left hates it. And I think it speaks to the odd realignment that is going on, not just in American politics, but to uh, how it, what's going on in politics in many other countries where you have, at least in what talk in the American context, how over the last 30 years or so, the Republican and Democratic parties have been swapping bases, that the core of the Democratic coalition for decades and decades was the New Deal coalition, which included a lot of blue collar workers, like the kind of workers you're seeing in participating in this trucking protest in Canada. And they have slowly but surely been moving into the Republican camp here in the United States. While similarly, you have the elite, higher educated, college educated, uh, wealthier, suburban city dwelling uh, people moving into the Democratic camp. They've been trading bases over that time. But Sam's observation is a fascinating one, that this is a workers' protest that the left is outraged about and that the right is incredibly enthusiastic about. So Canada is a country that's at least made up of two nations, constitutionally defined. So this, in, in deference to our Quebecois friends, this is Convoy de la Liberté. And... Um, this is another way you – know, Canadian political dynamics are just very different for all sorts of reasons. So you see that going on. And these, these protests are no longer just trucker protests. And this is no longer about the vaccine mandate. A lot of these protesters have said that they're not going to leave until all of the COVID-19 restrictions and mandates have left. So there is um, – there is a sense in which there's no easy off-ramp for the government at this point uh, because things have escalated. And at this point, this has really started to affect, you know, thankfully these have been largely nonviolent protests, but they have started to affect people's livelihoods. The shutdown of the Ambassador Bridge, which lasted nearly a week, caused auto plants in Michigan to close down temporarily due to shortages of parts and these sort of things. So this is a very serious situation, uh, not only for Canada, but also for the United States and how this is resolved. Um, and I'm not sure, short of giving the protesters what they want, there's an easy off-ramp for Prime Minister Trudeau. Yeah, I will... Uh Ignore the pun that you are either intentionally or unintentionally making there by talking about an off-ramp for truckers. Uh, but yes, I, 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 especially when you consider the rhetoric that Justin Trudeau has been using uh, over the last couple of weeks about all of this. Um, this goes back to the conversation that we were having last week or the week before. We're you know, what is the reason, and let's just keep using off-ramp as the way we're talking about this, because it, A, has been, and B, is just absolutely appropriate for this conversation, that you have had government officials here in the United States as well continue to blow by these off-ramps, these opportunities that they have available to them to be responsive to the polis and get rid of a lot of these restrictions, which – People, I think, very clearly are fed up with – I've made this point numerous times – that when you look at the two major uh, state elections that we have seen, what we saw at the end of 2021 
People have attempted to explain what happened in Virginia in a whole lot of different ways. It's it's CRT. It's um, you know it, it was school closures and all of that. It to me has always been overarching COVID policy, and it becomes a bit of a Rorschach that people can project what ever they're angry about and all the things that they're angry about into this idea of education in Virginia, right? That's why it was education. But to me, it was fundamentally COVID policy. And the reason that is, is because when you look at the results in New Jersey, where Governor Phil Murphy almost loses to somebody, nobody had any idea who he was, Bob Chitterelli. Nobody had any idea who this guy was. He was massively outspent by Phil Murphy. Is how do you explain the same big shift in New Jersey that nobody saw coming other than the one thing that seems to be the major issue for people, which is COVID policy writ large, taking on different forms. Because there was no campaign about critical race theory or school closures or education specifically in New Jersey. And you're seeing Phil Murphy realize what he needs to do because he is one of the governors who's announced that he is rescinding as many of these restrictions. They're ending masking mandates. Um, I think the reason, as we've discussed, is that politicians just do not want to admit that they were wrong about a lot of this stuff or that they let it go on way too long. And as a result, you get this kind of resistance like you're seeing in Canada. And I think, again, the interesting thing about it, what what makes this so interesting as a case to me is that it's happening in Canada. And I got this uh, this observation which came uh, – I got it from Jonah Goldberg, but it's in Seymour Martin Lipset's book, American Exceptionalism, A Double-Edged Sword, where the stock of people in Canada and the United States are not – Generally speaking, you go back to pre-revolutionary times, all that different from each other. There, there isn't huge cultural differences that existed at a period of time. You know, if you were uh, a, a royalist or a loyalist, you probably went to Canada at the start of the revolution. And if you were at, you know, for the revolution or at least okay with it, you stayed here. I'll give you this excerpt from Seymour Martin, Seymour Martin Lips, It's American Exceptionalism. The point may be illustrated by examining the results when the American and Canadian governments try to change the systems of measurement and weights to metric from the ancient and less logical system of miles, inches, pounds, and ounces. A quarter century ago, both countries told their citizens that in 15 years, they must use only metric measurements, uh, but that both systems could be used until a given date. The Canadians, whose Tory monarchical history and structures have made for much greater respect for and reliance on the state, and who have lower per capita crime, deviance, and litigiousness rates than Americans, conformed to the decision of their leaders and now follow the metric system, as anyone who has driven in Canada is aware. Americans ignored the new policy, and their highway signs still refer to miles, weights are in pounds and ounces, and temperature readings are in Fahrenheit. This is just not the kind of thing that you expect to see from Canadians. So before I comment at all on the tactics here, it is just interesting, Sam, that it is happening in Canada, um, which has been seemingly in support still. Um, their, their government is not well supported. It is a minority government that's barely, barely held together at this point. But by and large, the opinions of Canadian citizens are not really on the side of the truckers. And they've been generally OK with a lot of the COVID policy up till this point. Yes. And let's not forget that uh, Canada changed a great deal in the 1960s and 1970s uh, as a consequence of the long prime ministership of Pierre Trudeau, the father of the current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who very much shifted the country towards what you might call a type of modern liberal view of the world. Canada was actually a a relatively conservative country prior to that, and then everything changed in the 1960s and 1970s with Pierre Trudeau at the federal level, and then you had the outbreak of a very left-wing form of Quebec nationalism in, in Quebec, the province of Quebec. So Canada is very much a country today that you would expect uh, to be fully on board with, let's call it, the modern liberal approach that has manifested itself over the past uh, two years with regard to the pandemic. 
uh, massive use of the state, massive use of the government uh, to try and stem the spread, etc. All that is what one would expect from Canada. But the fact that you have so many people now who are fed up and not afraid to to be quite impolite, if you like, and Canadians are famously polite people, so willing to be impolite and direct and saying to the government, we are not prepared to keep going on this way, tells us something, I think, about the degree of pandemic or more, perhaps more accurately, degree of government response to pandemic uh, fatigue that is now permeating everywhere. And then you mentioned uh, the way, the fact that a number of uh, the New Jersey governor, a a Democrat, of course, has lifted lots and lots of restrictions now. There's a number of Democrat governments, governors in the United States who have done this. And uh, I'm not hardly the first person to say this, but I suspect that reflects the fact that it's not the science that has changed. The polling has changed on some of these matters. And let's see what happens in Canada as a consequence of this. Justin Trudeau is not a particularly popular man. Uh, even in Canada himself, he's seen as a bit of a joke figure, the sort of the ultimate woke, the woke, the ultimate woke politician. Uh, but he has, he has, I think, been experiencing a fair amount of blowback over the past uh, month or so as a consequence of this. And the, the sheer extremity of his rhetoric in response to the this this convoy of people who are saying just enough is enough, the extremity of his rhetoric, I think, testifies to that very real class divide that we're seeing emerge across Western countries now when it comes to not just the pandemic, but things like the economy, social issues, foreign policy, etc. One of the interesting things about Prime Minister Trudeau's sort of precarious position is, you know, they recently had an election, which he was hoping would have gone better for the Liberal Party. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as, an, as a result, he's he's sort of stuck in a minority government right now. And uh, in the polling data I've seen, both, uh, as you would expect, those who support the Freedom Convoy are, of course, view Prime Minister Trudeau as primarily, as the politician primarily responsible for this mess, but as well as those Canadians who are opposed are not satisfied with the way that Prime Minister Trudeau has handled this. Um, and, you know, there's been a recent shakeup in conservative party leadership um, because of this. And this is really transforming Canadian politics. I do want to talk a little bit about the tactics rather than the cause. Um, Because I think I would say that I – what this has revealed to me is certainly the limitations of the effectiveness of things like vaccine mandates, right? If we didn't know that already, I think it's pretty obvious now, uh, as Sam pointed out, that the vast majority of them are vaccinated. It is not about whether or not they are actually vaccinated. It is largely about what they are being required to do and what is being asked of them, that people really are just tired of this whole policy regime. So I think by and large, if we're just talking about the cause I think I'd largely agree with that. I'm sure I have some quibbles on on the margins, but not a major disagreement about the cause itself. But I did see this uh, this comment from uh, the Daily Wire's Matt Walsh, whose job is primarily, I think, to be kind of a doofus on Twitter. Uh, as people pointed out that he was objecting back last year to the way Black Lives Matter activists were blocking roadways and streets. Uh, and pointing out the hypocrisy on this, um, which I, just as an aside, this is one of the, to me, the most annoying features of our modern political and and social discourse is that everybody becomes a truffle swine for hypocrisy, that this is all that they're interested in pointing out is you said one thing at one time and now you're saying something different. It's useful, but the utility of it actually I think is pretty limited and not doesn't actually reveal all that much. But Walsh was pretty honest about it and said – I'm for it when it's when I like the cause and I'm against it when I don't like the cause. Well, 
perhaps I'm just different in that I feel a need to be consistent on some of these things. I do not like the tactics that are being employed here. I do not like this sense of lawlessness. I lived in Chicago for most of 15 years, and quite regularly, you would have these groups of activists who would block Lakeshore Drive, who would block the Kennedy Expressway, that would block traffic during rush hour to make their political point. And whether or not I agreed with their political cause, sometimes I did, often I did not, I've just never come across the person who has been inconvenienced and annoyed into agreeing with someone. So I, while we can, I think, evaluate the cause of the truckers and their larger point on one level, I think to me it's important to point out that I don't think these tactics are a good thing. And I, especially the blockade of the bridge and the impact that that has. I think as as Michael Brendan Doherty pointed out at National Review, it'd be one thing if they were refusing to work. But to actually blockade the bridge, you know, again, as Charlie Cook at National Review pointed out, blockades in an international context are an act of war. So I think that this is more serious and because I think people particularly on the right like the cause, they're ignoring the problems that I think there are with the tactics and I don't think that's a good thing. Well, the other thing I think to introduce into uh, this reflection is that in the case of the truckers, one has to ask what options do they have for bringing attention to their particular cause. So one, of course, as you say, would be simply to not work, right? And that would quickly, uh, people would quickly feel the effects of that. But my, my suspicion is it wouldn't be as visible. Whereas going to the Canadian capital and, and blockading the capital and causing all sorts of problems for the federal government, uh, it certainly has drawn not just the attention of Canadians but also people from around the world to the fact that in a country that is famed famed for its obedience to the government, uh, there are substantial numbers of people who are willing to say, well, no, I'm not going to put up with this. And this is one way in which they've manifested it. And one can argue about whether it's a good idea or not. I mean, I do think there are some significant drawbacks to it, whether it will make people change their minds about this. I think you're right, Eric. That's a very different question uh, altogether. But I'm also fascinated by, as I said before, the extremity of the federal Canadian government's reaction the way that Trudeau has been talking about people who are his fellow citizens who have not engaged in acts of violence, uh, that I think to me is it's, it's, it's a deep reflection of just how frustrated people are in many countries with their governments and the inability and unwillingness of a lot of governments to deal with this in a different way. It'd be very different, I think, if Trudeau said, look, I understand there are some significant problems. I appreciate that you're suffering, I, but there's been none of that, none of that rhetoric at all. It's basically you are an enemy of the people. It, it does, to me, also reveal something interesting about the, the philosophy of leftist collectivist government, right? So you, you can absolutely imagine Justin Trudeau being the kind of person he's made. Maybe he said this directly. I just am not aware of it. But the kind of person to express – in fact, I would bet dollars to donuts that within his early COVID rhetoric, you get something to the effect of the we're all in this together, right? We're all in this together. You get that all the time from the progressive left. But there's also, as Sam points out, this kind of underlying, we're all in this together, but you people are kind of icky, and we don't like icky people. It's something very bizarre, which I also think is true in the, at least the American context now, on this kind of new right, post-liberal right. We'll get to some of the foreign policy of that in a moment here. Which is to say, you know, there's all that talk about the, you know, the real America that you get from those types. And, you know, I, like, I'm sorry to break it to you, but San Francisco is also the real America and Chicago is also the real America. And because you don't want to live in those places doesn't mean they're less authentically American than, you know, Duluth or, uh, you know, Tulsa 
or any of the other more rural places that these people like to hold up as the real authentic America. It's all America, but both sides seem to be making these kinds of, you know, one collectivist statements, but then immediately excluding somebody from the collective that they seem to have just laid out. Well, it's it's a fair it's you rightly point out this is a failure of social solidarity, and at, at the at the at the very root of a lot of this is that failure of solidarity, and when you don't have that solidarity, and when you have these very disruptive sort of protest movements, even when they're nonviolent. Those consequences can be devastating. Um, I think of uh, the Indian independence movement. Um, Gandhi was very famously asked, you know, do you expect the British to just walk out of India? And he said, yes. And he successfully mobilized a nonviolent movement to essentially make that happen. One of the results of, of, you know, one of those results is Indian independence. Another one of the results of that is Indian partition. And what became, you know, conflict to this day between India and Pakistan that led to literally millions dead and displaced in the partition. So if you do not have that underlying social solidarity, and that's really the path forward here, the path forward here is is that move towards solidarity. Um, and that's a problem. That's, that's not just a political problem. Um, and, uh, no, uh, no, no protests or counter protests or assertions of bare government authority can solve that. Why don't we move now to our next topic? So as both of you are aware, and I'm sure many of our listeners are aware, there has been, uh, a buildup of tension between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin has positioned more and more troops on the border of Russia and Ukraine. Of course, you couldn't go back uh, only a number of years ago for the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Uh, There are a lot of people who seem to think that Vladimir Putin is on the cusp of making a more aggressive move against uh, the entirety of the country of Ukraine, which is a sovereign country. And there's a lot of question about what the American response could, would, should be to that in a piece that appeared – on February 5th in the New York Times, uh, Saurabh Amari, Patrick Deneen, and Gladden Pappen uh, weighed in the headline of this piece is that hawks are standing in the way of a new Republican party. Um, I A lot of interesting takeaways from this piece, but Sam, why don't I go to you first for what did you make of this? Well, I think there's a couple of things one can say. In the first place, there's no question, I think, that on the American right, there is a major rethinking of approaches to foreign policy that is going on. Uh, For a long time, particularly during the uh, George W. Bush administration, there was what is often called a neoconservative Uh, political tinge to the conduct of foreign policy in the United States. Remember, do you remember uh, George W. Bush's second inaugural uh, presidential address where he talked about the United States expanding freedom around the world, et cetera? And that, I think, was seen as a high watermark for that type of approach to foreign policy. Now, I think that across the right, ranging from what you might call traditionalists to uh, libertarian types, uh, their view of American foreign policy, which has been much more restrained, in some cases verging on isolationism, not all, but in some cases verging on a type of isolationism, I don't think there's any doubt that that type of thinking is on the ascendancy across the American right. And you'll find people ranging from Kirkian traditionalists to hedonistic libertarians uh, basically having a very similar view when it comes to the conduct of 
foreign policy. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. It's fatigue with war. It's fatigue with uh, the notion that the United States has to be the world's policeman, the fact that European countries for a long time have refused to basically pony up financially when it comes to defence spending promises they made, a complaint that was made not by just the Trump administration but also by the Obama administration and the George W. Bush administration. So that is a, this article, I think, reflects that changing dynamic. So that's I, I, just as a matter of fact, I think that is what is happening across significant sections of the American right today. But it also, I think, in the case of the three authors, it plays into their view of the United States as essentially moving in the direction of what you might call economic autarky or something like it. Because I'm sure you both notice that they talk about the need to reshore things for a type of movement towards uh, various forms of industrial policy. So it's not just a question in their mind of the United States taking a step back on the foreign foreign policy stage, especially when it comes to military intervention. It's a type of um, inner withdrawal that expands across foreign policy and into economic policy. It's no coincidence that they have all seem to have quite skeptical views about free trade, uh, and at least in some cases they have articulated positions in favour of industrial policy and other forms of government intervention, which they believe is necessary to shore up particular communities in the United States. And I think on the level of facts, there's also many, many problems with some of the economic ideas that were just beneath the surface of that that particular article. One of the I, I think Sam's right. I think, I mean, you can look at, there's certain parts of this that you can look and you can say, you know, this is, this is what Pat Buchanan's campaign in 1992 was about. This is not the new right. This is the 30-year-old minority position that has always been there in many cases. Um, so there's nothing, there's nothing new here. It does seem... The, the, the language of it seems very naive. The idea that there is a sort of unitary American foreign policy that is, in all cases, ideologically motivated. You just look around at the disparate ways we treat nations, the, the way we treat, let's say, a Pakistan compared to an Iran. If we look at the way we treat China as opposed to the way we treat Russia. Um, you know, we, we, when you have societies with, with – you get these disparate results. And I think that points to the fact that there really isn't – we like to think that there's a sort of unitary actor model um, in foreign policy – in a way that a lot of people also, the authors of this piece, like to think of government. That if you just, you know, if you replace the head, that everything flows from that. And there's just a fundamental ignorance of the sort of public choice insights that the foreign service, the intelligence services, the branches of the military, the Department of State – all of these have various people with various priorities and agendas. Often they come into conflict. Often those rivalries, you know, we see this in uh, September 11th. We create a whole government department in the Department of Homeland Security because there's some recognition that these rivalries and these different interests prevail. But none of that there's, – there's none of that awareness in this piece. Uh, Richard Hania has recently published a great book, Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy, How Generals, Weapons, Manufacturers and Foreign Governments Shape American Foreign Policy. This is something that I think any intelligent discussion of foreign policy has to factor in as opposed to a just sort of political posturing about foreign policy. This piece to me is simultaneously, uh, on one count, banal and unremarkable, and on another count, incredibly radical. 
the banal part to me is exactly what you pointed out, but it goes back even further than that. You don't have to just – you can't just go back to Buchanan. You can go all the way back to Taft. There has been always a strain within the right um, – philosophically, ideologically, coalitionally speaking, that has been skeptical of foreign entanglements. I mean, you can, you know, depending on how you want to parse these things out, you know, everybody who makes the argument for avoiding interventionism abroad traces it back to George Washington's farewell address and to avoid entangling alliances. So it, it's just unremarkable to me that uh, the the point that's being made here that you know, OK, so there are people on the right who are arguing for um, more retrenchment, who are arguing for a less aggressive foreign policy. And, and as Sam pointed out about, you know, the evolution of George W. Bush's term was incredible. In 2000, he's campaigning on having a more humble foreign policy. And then as the saying goes, events, my dear friend, events, 9-11 happens and you get the second inaugural and you get um, arguably a more aggressive foreign policy as a result of all of that. So – that part to me is just not all that interesting. The part that is – oh, and I, I, let me also say about that. Um, I think you get various versions of it too and this actually will lead into the second part. Uh, I have – I think I share a streak of a reticence to want to get involved in these things. I, you know, I've said for years um, – I was looking for what what's the reason we continue to remain in Afghanistan. And it turns out the best reason that I think to argue to be there is that it would get worse if we left than it would if we stayed. Um, I think that turned out to be a pretty compelling reason. Um, I think we were wrong about the Iraq war, but I don't know how one could have come to a different conclusion based on the case that was being made at the time. So I think I've been uh, you know, chastened in some sense about that and do want to kind of avoid these things. I think that there is um, also a more naive version of it that just kind of thinks, well, you know, things will just be fine if we withdraw from the world and the United States is not an active part of it. And, you know, power abhors a vacuum. Somebody will insert themselves. And I think the argument that one, particularly libertarians, have to encounter that changes libertarian foreign policy – um, from to an actual position rather than what I think it generally operates as, which is the lack of a position on foreign policy questions is, you know, well, who's going to fill the vacuum if it's not the United States? And that gets to me the part of this piece that is radical, which is the contempt for the West and the United States that these authors seem to have, that they do not think it's a good thing for the United States or the Western alliance to be the ones who are in there and influencing these outcomes, um, that it would be bad. You know, like the way that they point out, you know, all the bad things about America while simultaneously ignoring uh, the human rights abuses of China, ignoring the aggressive posture of Russia. And you can look specifically at these three individuals, Saurabh Amari in particular, who has said, you know, he is at peace with the idea of a China guiding the world. And uh, that is the kind of stuff that I find absolutely contemptible. And I think is what makes the real point that is being made in this piece, not the surface one about we should have um, a greater reticence to get involved in foreign affairs. Um, OK, so be it. That's an argument that's been made on the right for decades upon decades. It is this view that it is wrong for the United States and for the West that we don't have a better way of approaching things, that there is no moral upstandingness about it, I think is a contemptible position. And that seems to me to be what this piece is really about. I think also, Eric, <clears throat> on that point, if you read the magazine American Affairs, which at least two of the authors of the New York Times piece have written in and been associated with in different ways, to the best of my recollection, there's a consistent drum of pro-China pieces in that particular journal. And there is a type of uh, China-philic thinking that has emerged on in some pockets, I won't say widely, but some pockets of the American right, which curiously enough is matched by some of the pockets of similar sentiment on the left as expressed by people like Jeffrey Sachs, for example. 
So that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, you probably notice that they refer to China as a civilizational entity, and um, I, I think that's part of that type of thinking that is permeating some of these circles. And look, it's, there's no question that China is a different civilization. We shouldn't pretend that everyone is going to become just like the West. I think that sort of end of history in the last man thesis is thoroughly discredited now. And a lot of people on the right bought into that, remember, in the 1990s and early 2000s. But the other thing that is ignored here in this discussion about when it mentions China is that there's no mention of the fact that it's run by a highly authoritarian regime, which is, you know, pretty much standard for most of the past 5,000 years of Chinese history. But this is a regime that's also communist, materialistic, engaged in rigorous repression of groups ranging from Christians to Uyghur Muslims, etc. And the fact that uh, some people are talking about China without mentioning this dimension of what the Chinese regime is actually like is at, at a minimum strange, it's very, very strange. Now, it's one thing to say, okay, though, well, that means we have to take a very aggressive stance or no, this means we have to adopt a different set of policies. That's a different discussion. But the unwillingness to acknowledge just how bad the regime in China is and to make equivalencies between the United States and uh, a regime like China, I think in many respects is something that we should be generally worried about. Let's go to our final topic for today, which is uh, Dan's piece that appeared in the Detroit News last week. It is up on Acton's website at acton.org right now about the – yes, we're finally getting to the Joe Rogan controversy after studiously avoiding it uh, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, alas, it does not seem that it has uh, really – died down all that much. We had uh, two versions of an attempt to cancel Joe Rogan, first because he was a purveyor of misinformation about vaccines and about COVID, and then because of a compilation video. When that failed, um, then because of a compilation video of him using a racial slur, uh, that also seems to have failed. Uh, Dan, why don't you tell us what your piece was about? I mean, what my piece was about was more about the underlying anxiety. I go, I go through, of course, and, and sort of set the table with what this controversy is about. But this is originally animated by, by in particularly Neil Young's concern that Joe Rogan is spreading misinformation about the coronavirus and that this is leading to dire sort of public health consequences and that he felt that keeping his music on Spotify would make him sort of complicit in this. Um, there were several other musical artists that that joined this initial protest. But what I, I've always wondered is, does media work this way? If, let's say, in a world Joe Rogan is canceled, are, let's say, listeners of his that were skeptical of the mainstream consensus on the science around the coronavirus and vaccines, would they change their opinions if if all of a sudden they could not get any information from Joe Rogan? And I think that the social science data on this is, is, is just that that's not the case, that people's beliefs are formed out of their experience out of a whole factor of things and that in fact people choose media that aligns with their beliefs more than that the media shapes their beliefs. Um, and I started thinking along this way that where there's a software developer who wrote a piece, Andy McCossack, uh, on why books don't work. And the problem that sort of like, you know, you, you read all these books and then you forget, you know, half of it almost immediately. And, you know, his, his idea is that, you know, this is a bad thing. I think it's a blessed thing. Um, I mean, imagine a world in which whatever you heard or whatever you read all of a sudden transformed you. And in a way, you lose all your power and agency and all of a sudden you're putty in Joe Rogan's hands. And I think that's not the case. And I think 
when you realize that, that diffuses these sort of issues. And that becomes a conversation we can have where we're not looking at other people whose views are different and we just assume that they're brainwashed and we can actually sort of listen to them. And that's the way that people, I think, really change is through dialogue and encounter and, and those sorts of things. And that's sort of my, my, more, my more philosophical underpinnings of the essay. I get into the essay, you know, why people would be COVID hesitant uh, or, or COVID vaccine hesitant. One is that there are a lot of people that are just skeptical of modern medicine. And some of those people are just the kind of people that, you know, hey, if I get sick, I'm just going to walk it off. Or it's the kind of people that, you know, for instance, are involved in, you know, natural or alternative medicine communities of, of that, have, you know, always existed in the United States. Another could be the fact that there was a lot of politicized skepticism of the COVID vaccine and the process under which it was approved. Kamala Harris was famously hesitant on the campaign trail to take what she saw as a Trump vaccine because President Trump was applying pressure to the FDA to get an approval, to get waivers. The Biden administration applied similar pressure to get boosters approved. So there's folks that are that are scared of the, of the political process. Um, but also simultaneously very trusting of the regulatory process of the FDA, which I think has a terrible track record. And then there's folks that just see shifting public policy advice. You had people that were told, hey, if you get vaccinated, you don't have to mask. And now that is not so much the consensus. So, you know, there are all sorts of reasons that people might distrust sort of, you know, mainstream coronavirus recommendations. And they find in the Joe Rogan program some of those concerns that they may already have being brought to the table and being discussed in an open way. And that it's not so much a problem of, you know, disinformation, but the fact that the mainstream consensus isn't representative of the experiences of people, right or wrong. So much of the Joe Rogan program, and I, I'll disclose up front that I am not a listener to the Joe Rogan program, um, although I I understand from uh, clips that I have seen and from people I know who are listeners, I entirely get why people like him because he doesn't seem to have that much of an agenda when he brings people on. And I think he recognizes within the current media space what voices are aren't being heard. And he says, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should talk to the person whose voice isn't being heard. In a way, it's kind of counter-programming to that consensus that you just talked about there. Um, I think you're absolutely right that it, there seems to be underlying this, this belief that absent the existence of Joe Rogan and the Joe Rogan experience, all the people who listen to the, his program, if not for his existence, if not for the conversations he was having, they would all be exactly the kind of people that uh, those critical of Rogan want them to be, cheerleading the vaccine, happily masking up, happily doing all the things that we discussed in the first segment of this program that we said are generally driving people crazy with the COVID. COVID regimes. That idea just seems idiotic to me. I, I just I don't know how you arrive at the point of view that, you know, if not if but for this one person, uh, everything would just be absolutely hunky dory. And the idea and this has just gotten more and more to be a burr under my saddle of this concern about misinformation on one level, completely agree. Um, I think we should be concerned about purveyors of misinformation, um, whether it is out of ignorance or malice. I think there are certainly actors out there in uh, in the media space who are purveyors of misinformation with malice. Alex Jones comes to mind. But uh, Rogan does seem to be engaged in some kind of a good faith exploration of ideas. And you know what? We're human beings. We're fallible. We're going to get things wrong. We're going to obsess on one part to the exclusion of other things that probably should be in there contextualizing our view on it. And all I could think of is um, a lot of the people who are so critical of Joe Rogan right now as a purveyor of misinformation. 
How many of them do you think were regular, dedicated, nightly watchers of The Daily Show? I bet a great number of them. And Jon Stewart's whole shtick on The Daily Show was presenting heavily edited, out-of-context interviews that made people look good or bad depending on whether or not he liked them, which another word for which could be misinformation. But there's no problem with that because it was always for a good cause, but because they're in a philosophical or ideological misalignment with Joe Rogan, now this is some great threat and people can't hear from this guy. And if only we could get rid of him, everything would be fixed. It's just an idiotic position and it's not true. Well, like you, Eric, I had never listened to the Joe Rogan show up until the recent controversy. I, I'm not sure I actually knew who Joe Rogan was, which probably tells you something about uh, me and the things I follow and read and am interested in. But I did actually listen to some podcasts as a consequence of this controversy. And the thing that struck me was that he spends most of the time just asking questions. And he leaves it, I think, very much up to the listener to make their own view of what he what they're hearing. It didn't seem to me to be trying to push people in a particular direction. But it also speaks, I think, this current controversy speaks to the also the fact that just how much of, let's call it, legacy media, mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, just how distrusted it is now. And there are reasons why it's distrusted. And it's not just people on the right who have developed a distrust of a lot of this legacy media. You can find critical commentary on the left as well. Liberals saying things like, well, I might agree with what's being said, but it's clear there's no substantive debate going on in the context of these particular settings. Yeah, the Ch- Chomskyite manufacturing consent and all of that. Yeah, the, right, the critiques right. of corporate media from the left have always been there. Right, right, right. And so uh, what we're finding, I think, is that this disillusionment and distrust of mainstream, let's call it MSS, whatever one, how one wants to describe these institutions, they're just not trusted. And one would think that some of these institutions – if they're interested in being media organizations that are engaged in serious discussion of complicated questions, whether it's trade, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's pandemics or vaccines, if they were interested in promoting serious reflection upon these issues, you'd think that they would be asking themselves some serious questions about why they are why, – why journalists, for example, uh, in many of these ratings of professions – uh, are right up there with bank robbers when it comes to their view of how people view particular professions. But they're not. They're not engaging, as far as I can tell, in any deep analysis of why this has become the case. And it may be that they don't think that that's their role anymore. It, it, seem, it does seem to me that a lot of the Joe Rogan phenomenon and a lot of the alternative media phenomenon is a answer to the epistemological certainty of the media in its uh, own objectiveness – over the last, uh, I mean, you could go back 60, 70 years and all this, Walter Cronkite signing off famously his news broadcast with, and that's the way it is, as if you know, the voice of God has just spoken and this is the unadulterated truth. Whereas American media has always been a little bizarre, at least kind of post, um, you know, uh, well, within the 20th century in that it approaches this kind of journalistic ethics, Columbia journalism school, objective reporting approach to things where if you look at, you know, in the United Kingdom, newspapers are incredibly partisan. I mean, the the, the Times is a Tory, uh, gives a Tory opinion. The Guardian is Bolshevik and you have a various um, uh, other p- positions in between there. And in the United States, we have largely had this alternative, but this is the objective reported truth. We're just putting a camera on it and showing you exactly what is happening. And the reality is that there's so much bias that underlines that and not nefarious bias, just people's interests, their story selection. It is always going to influence these things. And it's just gotten so bad and so obvious to the point that Sam was making there that people like Rogan who just sit there and ask questions are an answer to that. 
So one one of the one of the questions when we look at this is we we look back on that Cronkite experience and we think about that as a unified media experience. Yet I think that's also the height of probably John Birch newsletters. And there have always been people um, who have held differing opinions from the mainstream. It has never been easier for those people to voice those opinions, for those people to hear those opinions. And what we're witnessing in this sort of like cacophony is um, a sort of democratization of media. And there are great things with that and there are challenges with that. Um, and, uh, you know, Joe Rogan is very illustrative at this point. When you look at when you look at his numbers, and you see these numbers of him having you know sort of like eleven million listeners, that's double what Tucker Carlson has in Fox News. And Tucker Carlson is the one who dominates that game. Um, and and that's and still you look at in a nation of over three hundred and thirty million people, that's eleven million. And 11 million of those people, probably like a substantial amount of Joe Rogan's audience, disagrees with him over – or his guest over any particular episode. And these are really drops in the bucket of what is a very immense nation. And we, and we often lose sight of that. Um, and, and we're going to see more and more of this in the future. It's – you know, there there are good and bad things about the you know homogenous Cronkite era, and there are good and bad things about the current democratized era. It, it's almost like there are trade offs in everything. It's very weird. <laughs> Let's call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Acton Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes where you will find a link that you can subscribe directly to Acton Unwind or just search Acton Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people can find this program. Thanks to Sam. Thanks to Dan. For the Acton Institute, this is Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week. <laughs>